Singapore is facing a massive skills shortage. A 2014 study by the Australian Computer Society found that 100,000 new jobs will be created in the technology industry over the next decade. But at the same time, fewer than half that number of students will graduate from technology degrees. Well may Australia of the future need to be agile, innovative and creative, but if we can't source and support the local talent, there's no way we can achieve this. So if we look specifically at computer science, the numbers are really bad. Fewer students are learning computer science at universities than they were 20 years ago. And when you look at schools, it's even worse. So the number of students studying computing-related subjects, technology, in the HSC, looking just at New South Wales alone, is plummeting. This is not a happy graph. So the two subjects here are software design and development, the blue line, and this is the only subject that actually involves coding as a core requirement. And information processes and technology is the, the red line, and that is not the right direction it should be going. So you might be thinking, why am I showing a graph that is this unhappy? But there's an absolute game changer on the horizon. And this is the new digital technologies curriculum as part of the national curriculum that's being rolled out across Australia. So from next year, every state, except for New South Wales, who is dragging their heels, will be teaching computing as part of a core requirement for every student in grade five and six, and every student in grade seven and eight will learn to code using a general purpose programming language like Python or Java. And this is amazing. This has an amazing potential for us in the technology sector and for the students themselves. But so far, discussion of teacher development, teacher professional development, and resources for actual supporting of this curriculum have been conspicuously absent. So the real issue in terms of why students aren't choosing to learn computer science and STEM is summed up nicely by this chief scientist, Ian Chubb. So the real issue is how we're teaching what we're teaching and why aren't we making it so compellingly interesting that people want to do it. Now, compellingly interesting, engaging experiences with code is exactly what I'm about. And that's exactly what my startup, Grok Learning, is about. Because when you introduce computer science and STEM in an engaging way, in a way that students see the relevance, they absolutely get hooked. And I speak from personal experience for this. So I myself came from a languages and linguistics background. And I only learned to code when I found a reason to do so. So for me, that was I wanted to fix machine translation, because it was really bad. So I took the plunge, I decided to learn to code, and I enrolled in a PhD in computer science. And I haven't looked back since. So while I was doing that, I also got involved in a lot of outreach activities. Um, and this is perhaps due to the most powerful force in the universe, procrastination. So in, re in delivering these outreach activities, it's about trying to get kids really engaged with code. So specifically, I help run the National Computer Science School from the University of Sydney. So we bring in 100 students from across Australia and New Zealand and get them in a really intensive 10-day summer camp. They learn rapid web development, they build a social networking site, or they learn about embedded systems design. And this is a really life-changing experience for them. They leave there passionate about computer science and about tech entrepreneurship. This program has a massive amount of support from industry behind it. We've got sponsors like Google, Freelancer, Wise Tech Global, and Atlassian, and they've been sponsoring us for several years. But the problem with a program like this is it just doesn't scale. So that, started, that encouraged us to start the NCSS Challenge several years ago. So the challenge is an online platform where students learn to code as they compete. It's a competition that teaches programming as part of its development. So the NCS test challenge is five weeks where students and teachers work together to solve problems with code. And that's a really exciting thing. The challenge started as a way of extending the strongest students in a classroom. So little Sally can have something more productive and less destructive to do than continuing to try and hack the school network. And the response we got from teachers was really positive. So they wanted to know whether we could run courses for some of their other students, for some of their younger students. And pretty soon we were running three concurrent streams of the challenge. But we kept getting questions along the lines of, this is great, but can I run it with 12-year-old kids? And can you teach web development and CSS? And uh, can I do it in term one? And does it come in black? 
And we desperately wanted to say yes to these questions. So this proof of demand from the market enabled the four of us who ran the NCSS challenge to take the plunge and found Grok Learning as a startup that's dedicated to teaching the world to code and to, teach and to support teachers in delivering this. So we started from the ground up with scalability in mind. Everything is on the cloud, we run AWS, which means that we can scale in seconds. We run at least one big competition in every school term. We have courses that teachers can do throughout the year. We teach HTML and CSS, and we're working on databases and many other languages as well. And it might not come in black, but our site is really beautiful. But more than that, it's practical, and it's designed with a classroom experience in mind, because we understand what's needed. So, Teaching computer science, the first hurdle for teachers is getting software actually installed that would allow this to happen. And there's a lot of bureaucratic uh, hurdles to, to, to achieve in this. So if you think back and every Australian was given, every Australian student was given a laptop, not a single programming language was actually installed on those laptops given to every Australian student. And that just seems like a pretty, pretty nonsensical idea. So with Grok Learning, we actually have a Python interpreter in the browser, which means that teachers don't have to navigate that. But it also means that students have a really low barrier. They can get in and get engaged with the content immediately. It means that they can keep working through our notes and resources, whether they're at school, at home, in the library, or at their grandparents' house. So as we introduce a concept using our interactive notes, we have a Python snippet there of code. And kids can actually muck around with that, run it, change it, and see what effect that change has had so they're immediately engaging with these concepts. And that's really powerful. So once we have introduced a concept, we immediately then have a question that tests that concept. And that's really important from a pedagogical point of view. So that Formative assessment is really important in, in teaching students how to code and without it being too frustrating. But if they do get frustrated, during our big competitions, we've got moderated forums where students can go and ask for help from their peers and from our tutors. And so far, we've had nearly two million code submissions in just over two years and have over 120,000 students with accounts. In terms of scaling up, we've come a long way from a single classroom. So there are some things that are easier to scale up than others, and probably the hardest thing to scale is teachers. And when you think about it, teachers, computing teachers, have a really hard job. If you think about a maths teacher, the content that they're teaching is pretty much the same thing that they learned in the classroom themselves years before, but computing teachers don't have this luxury. Maths teachers, it's pretty rare for them to have students who understand the core principles of linear algebra or calculus on a deeper level than they do. But when talking to teachers of computing, this happens every year, and that's a bit intimidating. But perhaps the biggest factor is that maths, students of maths know that maths is important, and their parents do too. But computing teachers are facing a real uphill battle in terms of fighting stereotypes of computing being a blood subject and completely irrelevant for students. And we know that's not true, but that message isn't being delivered to their students. So we take teacher training and professional development really seriously. Every teacher can learn to code on our site for free for their own professional development. And we take it seriously in terms of encouraging, encouraging teachers to learn to code alongside their students. So this is actually a really important lesson for the students to learn that the, sub the subject that they're learning, their teacher thinks is important enough to learn alongside them. And it also means that, teacher, that students are uh, familiarized with the idea that adults don't actually know everything and continued education is part of the real world. So most importantly, teachers know that we have their back and we do the heavy lifting in terms of content delivery so they can focus on being present in the classroom, developing their skills and engaging their students. So when it comes to students, how do we make computer science so compellingly interesting and show them that this is a really engaging opportunity for them? And for them, it's all about those questions that we write. So the idea is that we want to get 
students excited about solving real world problems with code. So we challenged them to write a program to help estimate the speed of light using marshmallows in a microwave. Or we get them to generate poetry using Twitter and a rhyming dictionary. And these sorts of exciting things are really what drives students in following their own passions and finding their own interests and how they work with computer science. Now, in terms of educational resources, unfortunately, many computer science resources have implicit messages that actively discourage certain groups from pursuing them. And we take this really, we think this is really important. And we work actively to ensure that there's questions and content that will engage every single student, from science to sport, logarithms to literature. Every kid finds something that interests them that's a real world skill. So more than to these questions, this, this, is a, this is a point about teaching kids to solve problems with code. And that is about showing its relevance. Computer science is more than just word processing. It's certainly more than just Excel spreadsheets. But at the moment, that message isn't being delivered in classrooms. And that is where we need the startup industry to help. So we all know that computer science is fun and engaging and innovative. But we need to show students that it's relevant for them as well. So this is where Grok Learning comes in. We're a startup written by educators for educators. So all four of our, us as co-founders are both coders and have experience in teaching computer science in a classroom environment. This means that we can combine our expertise in education with our tech and business skills as well. And this is really important. In fact, the education sphere could learn a lot from the software world and being more agile. But ultimately, our business model is the same as our impact model. So if our goal is that we want every student to learn to program, we need to find a sustainable and scalable business model to solve this problem. So we have deliberately aligned both our social impact with our business. So for a $30 subscription, students have access to all of our courses and competitions for 12 months. This means that even after a teacher has finished a particular concept at, at, in class, the keen students can keep working and learn independently. And this is really important from our philosophy. But it also means that we've been able to bootstrap and have thus far avoided taking on external investment, which means that we're free to make the important decisions. And looking forward, Continuing to build this sustainable business model is the number one priority for us. So I want to impart a few lessons that we've learned in trying to discover this sustainable business model. And the first is that even if you know that there's a business demand for your product, you might still have some challenges in terms of reaching your reluctant market. So for us, this has mostly been the case of let's say, misunderstandings. So a few lessons that we've had to try and re-educate our audience are that consumption is not creation. So when I talk to parents and their student, and they say, well, of course my kid Timmy is a tech genius. He spends hours on Facebook every night. Well, that's a bit frustrating for me, because I know full well that con technology consumption is not the same as creation. So the next thing is when talking to teachers, the, the misconception that a catalyst is not the same as comprehension. When I ask whether they teach coding in their schools and they say, oh yeah, we did an hour of code last year. And I think, well, how much can a student learn in a single hour without comprehensive and engaging follow-up from that? And the third aspect is what I'm going to refer to as stereotype rubbish. And this is a case when I call up predominantly girls' schools and say, invite them to have their students participate in our competitions. And they say, oh no, our girls wouldn't be interested in that sort of thing. Now that is really frustrating because it means that that teacher has essentially prohibited the student from making a decision about whether this interests them. We need that student to have engaging, authentic experiences with com computer science in order to go on and pursue this in the future. So, so far, the only way of combating these issues is to be incredibly stubborn and just continuing to educate your audience until they understand the importance of what you're trying to do. So one lesson in that 
when you're looking for your first customers and trying to get them to understand what you're trying to do, is that not everything needs to be scalable at first. So for us, this involved calling up schools across the world at all hours of the day and night, and that's not something I want to do in the future. It also involved going out to schools, physically driving to their locations and fixing their proxy settings so that their students could access our site. Again, this is not scalable on a global level, but boy did we get brownie points for it. So the second issue is motivating that market. So once you know there's demand and you've identified your audience, you need to get them to actually commit to making a purchase. So for us, competitions are a really great measure of this. So competitions give students, sorry, give teachers a reason to subscribe their students. But they also, more importantly, give teachers a deadline to do so by. Now, schools love competitions because they like celebrating their students' academic achievements, but also the students themselves really like the aspect of competitions. It's a five-week program, and students can sign up and commit to that. There's an end in sight, and they know that thousands of other students are participating alongside them. So the second aspect is achievements. So students love earning badges almost perhaps as much as teachers do. And we've allowed badges to be easily shareable. So that means that when a student feels proud of accomplishing something, they can then share that and create a more dynamic and, and important marketing message as well. And let's face it, writing an ASCII art version of Pac-Man is an achievement worth bragging about. So we make that ridiculously easy for them. And the third aspect is community. So I mentioned We've got online forums during our big competitions, and it's really a motivating factor for students to log on and discover thousands of other students who are passionate and engaged in the same things that they are. That motivating factor not only keeps them engaged in the site, but it convinces them that other people think that this is important as, as much as they do. And that works for teachers as well. So the third issue, the third lesson, is to realize the value in partnerships, both formal and informal. Partnerships help you stay motivated, stay afloat, and ultimately help you find a sustainable business model. But it's really important to not stray from your path in terms of these partnerships. You need to make sure that these partnerships are at core with what you want to do and what you want to achieve in your business. Now, often these partnerships that aren't that are an, a great opportunity for you to pivot, but you need to make sure that you make that as a conscious decision and not just an agreement that ends up having you spread your engineering team too thin trying to achieve too many things at once. So for us, we've partnered with schools who are tech leaders across Australia and the globe. We've also partnered with universities. So we deliver the first year undergraduate programming course for the University of Melbourne, and we work with teachers in the education faculty at the Australian Catholic University. Industry partnerships are also great. So we've partnered with Microsoft recently, and we'll be massively expanding our reach and our audience by being included in the DreamSpark program. And we're also working on new courses that will teach students not just to a web design and development, but also to deploy them directly to the cloud. Now, one other aspect of partnerships that is often overlooked is partnerships with not-for-profits. So we've been an official partner of Code.org's Hour of Code initiative since its initiation. And for us, this is a massive marketing campaign. So we had 100,000 students, 100,000 sessions in one week during Computer Science Education Week in 2013. And this is massive for a new startup. This sort of marketing is, is really amazing and wonderful on a global level. But not-for-profit partnerships also help us with our social mission. So we've partnered with the Cambodian Children's Trust and are teaching hundreds of Cambodian kids to code. And for them, this is more than just computational thinking. This is teaching these, skill, these kids the skills they need to lift themselves out of poverty. And in terms of Cambodia's in general, this has the potential to have a massive impact on the Cambodian economy. So what's next for Team Grok? So first up is that we need to scale to meet the challenge of the digital technology curriculum. Tens of thousands of students in each state are suddenly going to be learning computing, and we need to support teachers in delivering really engaging and impactful lessons in technology. 
we need to engage in providing them the skills that they need to teach computers to kids in a fun and exciting way. And we are ready to scale up and meet this challenge head on. And I ask all of the startup community to continue to do this and engage with their teachers, with their students, and with the local community in showing and demonstrating the importance and relevance of computing and computer science for Australia in general. But while we're doing this, we're also keeping an eye on the enormous growth opportunities internationally. So the United Kingdom has more than twice as many students as Australia does. And America has 50 million students. And these have massive potential for us. So the UK recently introduced their own very ambitious national curriculum, which teaches computational thinking and coding from kindergarten. And their teachers are similarly seeking resources that they can use to deliver engaging experiences with code for their students. In America, each county can actually decide what they teach. So there are initiatives like the Common Core that are encouraging computer science to be taught across America. And we're looking at working into that and delivering courses that align directly with the curriculum for this. A little closer to home, we're really proud to be part of the changing face of startups in Australia and to be part of the Sydney startup movement. So we're part of the Sanity program at the University of Sydney, which is sponsoring and finding a home for local startups. But more than that, I'm really excited to be able to produce, uh, to, to be teaching thousands of young students to become tech literate, thousands of potential entrepreneurs, and I'm really excited about the potential impact this will have on Australia's startup industry in the coming years. So if you have questions, if you want to get involved or you want to try out the site yourself, you can find me at these details below or at any time over the next two days of, this, of the startup. Thanks. Thank you.